so thanks for having me, and it's great to be here. Basically, I'm going to change the topic a little bit. We're going to talk about bone health, because I think probably every single person in this room has either been a dancer or has treated a dancer with a fracture. Am I right? Who has not had a dancer who's gotten a stress fracture? Bam! That's exactly the point. So. <laughs> Um, basically, the, the thing is we work with a lot of adolescents, and adolescence is a huge time to build bone density. We have to realize that bone is a dynamic tissue, and it adapts to its mechanical environment throughout, la uh, throughout life, but it's really important during childhood and adolescence. The growing skeleton is particularly responsive to exercise prior to the end of puberty. And girls who begin strenuous exercise prior to getting their first period, prior to menarche, gain twice as much bone mineral content as do girls who begin after puberty. So that's why it's so important for people to be active and to get our kids active, at least from the skeleton standpoint. So I use this statement all the time, and it's really important to remember. 90% of, of a woman's peak bone mass is accrued by the age of 18. So if we don't talk about periods and we don't talk about weight-bearing activity until after that, we've really lost an important time in life where we could have really increased their bone density. So if you look at that solid line, that's the normal trajectory. There's this huge increase during adolescence. During your 20s, it kind of slows down. During your 30s, it just kind of plateaus. Menopause hits, there's a big drop in hormones, so then there's this abrupt drop, but then it kind of slows down, it kind of trickles down. So we're not surprised if someone gets osteoporosis when they're 90, but we certainly don't want them to get osteoporosis when they're 25. And if somebody's got inadequate lifestyle factors like amenorrhea, they've um, had energy restriction, they're dieting, all sorts of bad habits as kids and adolescents, they never get to that peak. So we want to get them as high up in that peak as possible because we know this other stuff is inevitable anyway. So we really want to get them high to begin with. 60% of the risk of developing osteoporosis can be explained by the amount of bone mass accrued by early adulthood. So what about sports? Basically looking at kids and young adults, 10 to 30, high impact loading. So things like gymnastics, hurdling, judo, karate, volleyball, all sorts of jumping sports, or odd impact loading, doing things like soccer, basketball, racket games, step aerobics, and speed skating are all good for bone. And those have all been associated with higher bone mineral composition and bone mineral density and enhanced bone geometry. So enhanced bone geometry is when you can get a 3D image of the bone and you can really see that there's thicker trabeculi and the, the cortex is thicker. And that's an anatomic region specific, specific to the loading patterns of each sport. So meaning if they're jumping on their legs all the time, it's going to be really good for their legs. If they're doing things like rowing for their back, that's going to be really good for the spine. So it's, it's where the bone is loaded. The osteogenic or bone building potential of a particular physical activity really depends on the magnitude of the load, the rate at which the load is applied, and the duration of the loading bout, also the novel nature. So that's why it's good for kids to mix it up and to do different types of sports and different types of loading. So there's, the body doesn't get used to the loading. So we think of a couple different ways. This is a 3D picture. This is using HRPQCT, so it's high resolution peripheral, peripheral quantitative CT. And it's a fancy word for just showing you that we can see it in a 3D image. So that's the cortex of the bone. All those little um, spaces in there are the spaces between the trabeculi. And so the goal is to get the bone to be wide. So a bone that is wider is going to have a wider, it's going to have a, a stronger moment of inertia than if it's a really skinny bone getting things on it. And then you also want the cortex to be thick. So ideally, you have a bone that's nice and wide, the cortex is really thick, and then there's a lot of trabeculi in the center. Um, so what, what kind of building duration do you need for this to work? So studies suggest that at least seven months of impact exercise is essential to induce a measurable change in bone mass in kids. And pre and early puberty are the times when the skeleton's response to loading is optimal. The sensitivity of bone to an imposed mechanical strain created by impact loading is influenced by a lot of things though. So if you have a kid and they're doing all this loading, that's great. But if they're not eating well and they don't have the right hormones circulating, this doesn't really work as well. So just engaging in physical activity does not necessarily guarantee that they're going to gain enough bone and have po positive skeleton uh, changes. So this is where we get to a lot of the dance population where these girls are trying to be super, super skinny while they're training a ton and they're jumping and they're doing all this good stuff. But if they're really denying their nutritional um, needs, then they run into trouble. So female athlete try it. How many of you have heard of this? So I hope you all remember this before you leave those of you who haven't because it's really uh, prevalent in the dance community. 
So this is a term that came up in 1992 at the American College of Sports Medicine, then they wrote a position statement about it in 1997 because they were seeing this correlation between um, eating disorders or low energy availability with or without an eating disorder, then having a loss of menses so they don't have normal menstrual cycles, and then having low bone density. So that was being talked about in the 90s, research had started in the 80s, and then there was an update in that position statement in 2007. And they said, you know, it's really a continuum, and you don't necessarily find a dancer who's in, got all the three of those things at once. So especially with our adolescents, we may catch them with a decrease in optimal energy availability. Maybe they have just joined a ballet company and somebody made a comment and they started restricting their diet. They haven't lost their period yet, but they're starting to get a little irregular. Or they may have never gone through puberty and they think that's totally normal to be 17 and a half and they haven't gotten their period yet. Um, and so all these things kind of go down a slippery slope. So sometimes I'll see somebody with a stress fracture and they've maybe had one or two stress fractures, someone sent them to me and then we start talking about this and it turns out their BMI is really low, they haven't gotten their period yet, we check a bone density and it turns out their bones aren't so good. So it's really important to think of all of your dancers on this continuum and making sure that this stuff is getting optimized because if they do do the weight bearing, they get their period at the normal time, the periods are consistent, that tends to tell us that their food intake is good. They should have better bones than the average population because of all the pounding they're doing. They're spending all this time in the studio. So there was a recent Female Athlete Triad Coalition um, Return to Play document that came out in February. And then about a month after that, there was another document that came out called Red Ass by the IOC. And it kind of doesn't matter what you want to call all this stuff. There's a little debate about what's the proper term. So Red Ass basically broadened the concept and said, you know what, it's not just girls, this can also happen to boys, it might not be about their menstrual cycle, but if they are having energy deficits, so that stands for reduced, or sorry, relative energy deficiency in sport, if they're having a decreased energy intake and they're not getting enough to fuel their system, they can have all sorts of other complications. So they can have immunologic issues, they can have GI issues. You hear about a lot of these girls who say, oh yeah, I just get really constipated. That's totally related to the eating pattern. Um, cardiovascular issues, so we know that there's um, poor endothelial function, meaning that the arteries don't dilate as well. Um, and then there's psychological issues. These kids get really stressed and really obsessed about their food. Growth and development, they might fall off their growth curve. Um, the hematologic, so their white blood cell count is lower. Metabolic rate changes, we're going to talk about the endocrine stuff. And then you get up to the more classic triad. So whatever term we want to use, it's a real issue, and the IOC is just saying, we need to study men, we need to study our adaptive athletes, we need to study the whole population and see what other consequences there are from low fueling. So how many, how many of our dancers have the, the triad? Um, in a pre-professional ballet dancer, and I should mention that you should never do this stretch. Ruth pointed that out when I showed her this picture. You should, I just had a girl a few weeks ago who came in and had a hamstring pull because her friend was stretching her in dance class. So do the stretch on your own, don't let your friends do it. Um, so there were 127 female dancers around age 16 and a half in this study. They started dancing when they were 5.8 years. They danced 22 hours a week. And the BMI for their age was found to be normal in only 42.5% of them, while 15.7% had a severe degree of thinness. Menarche, when their first period happened, on average was late. And the food intake was below the recommendations for a normally active population in all food group groups except animal protein. So for some reason they were good about doing that. But the intake was more than twice what the recommended amount was. So they thought, oh, I'll just eat lean protein and I'll just uh, skip all this other stuff, especially carbs and fat. And then what about um, other aspects of it? So bone mineral density was low and it was associated with nutritional factors. Dairy products had a positive, and non-dairy proteins had a negative correlation with bone mineral density. So when we send people to see our sports nutritionist, she's always trying to get them to drink milk and realize that dairy can be a really important part of the diet. There was a positive correlation between bone mineral density and years since menarche. And basically, that's just a fancy way of saying the more periods they've had, obviously their bone density would be, would be better. So if they got their period at 12, that would be better if the girl's 17 than if she got her period two months ago. So it's important to realize that this concept of low energy, low energy availability can be this huge range. You know, there's an eating disorder, which is a cl clinical mental disorder that's now characterized in DSM-5. There was a DSM-4 that was a psych manual, now it's updated to DSM-5. And it's really expanded the definition of what anorexia is, what bulimia is, um, an eating disorder not otherwise specified, EDNOS. 
And basically, they're all saying it's abnormal eating behaviors and irrational fear of gaining weight, false beliefs about eating weight and shape. So I tend not to throw the term eating disorder at my patients right away. That's a great way to make them never come back. Um, especially the parents who are convinced that their kid is totally fine. That's probably the biggest problem with some of our adolescent patients is the parents don't believe you yet. So now with this eating disorder definition, it's really broad. Like you could have anorexia but not have amenorrhea. So they might be restricting their diet but they haven't lost their menstrual cycle. Or you could have anorexia and not be below the 85 percentile of weight. So that really makes that definition of anorexia murky. Bulimia, same thing. There used to be a certain number of times you had to vomit or, or purge to be a bulimic, and now it's only once a week. Um, or, and it can, doesn't have to be purging. It could be that they overexercise to lose the weight. So people can have an eating disorder, and the, and the definition is very broad, but nobody wants to be told that that's what they have. So I really focus at first on this low energy availability without accusing them of having crazy eating patterns yet. And then there's this disordered eating, which is various abnormal eating behaviors that can be a little bit restrictive. They might fast, they might skip meals, they might try diet pills or laxatives, diuretics, enemas. They might overeat and then starve for a few meals. They could binge and purge, but not as often as once a week. And so this is where a lot of my patients fall into, is they're just kind of get developing some bad habits. And I think a lot of times the dance studio is a culture where people are learning different things from each other, um, and they fall into a lot of this disordered eating pattern. So there was a study that was done by Ann Laux back in the 90s, and this has been replicated. Um, but it's hard to replicate it because it needs to be done in a very controlled environment. The patients stayed over. These were done in adults. They stayed over in the hospital, and they had their dietary intake given to them, and they had their exercise output, output monitored. So this is really hard to do just in a dance studio or with the general population, and it hasn't been done in kids. But the point was they did... They came up with this equation, dietary energy intake minus exercise energy expenditure normalized to fat-free mass. And they figured out the fat-free mass by doing a DEXA scan, which is a bone density scan. It can figure out bone density, lean mass, fat mass. And they basically said energy availability equals the energy intake minus that exercise energy expenditure normalized to fat-free mass. And the number should be above 30 for the hormones to work normally. Again, this was adult women, so it could be much higher for kids. And so if I have a patient who tells me she eats 2,000 calories and she's 23, like to a lot of women that seems like a fair amount of food, and let's say she went for a run or did a couple dance, um, a few hours of dance and she burned 600 calories, and she's like 130 pounds so her lean mass is maybe 51 kilos, um, she would only be 27.5 kilocals per kg of fat-free mass. So those numbers don't sound crazy if you just talk about them, but a lot of our dancers are coming in with way worse numbers than that. So this person came to me, this was an actual patient, and she was not somebody who had a bad relationship with food or had a bad body image. She just wasn't fueling enough. Those are my favorite patients. They're so easy. It's just a question of education. Most of my patients aren't like that. Most of them are like, there's no way I can eat 2,000 calories, and you know, they're eating 1,300, so they have a bigger issue. Um, and so, and it's also hard to calculate for a lot of people what the exercise energy expenditure is. They're not wearing heart rate monitors all the time. They're spending hours in the studio. Some practices are harder than others. Um, so it's very variable. Um, so what's, the, what's the, uh, the prevalence of eating disorders or disordered eating in ballet dancers? In a study of professional dancers, 83% had a lifetime history of anorexia, bulimia, or both. And this is with the prior definitions with the DSM-4. So we're talking about when you really had to be amenorrheic or you had to have this BMI below the 85th percentile. So it's huge, and it's really important for us to notice. It's also important for you to notice her awesome fifth position. Um, and I love this quote by Dame Monica Mason, who's over in England. And she basically said, any director of a company who said they have never had an anorexic dancer would have to be lying. Perhaps in the past we were more in denial. We are now in a situation where we can recognize it and really try to help these young people. So amen to her. We need more dance people to be saying that kind of stuff, especially the people who are in charge, the artistic directors, etc. In a study of 239 adolescent female ballet dancers, the dancers reported a variety of lifetime disordered eating behaviors to control weight and they included fasting, vomiting, laxative use, and I, I mean, these are people reporting it. So imagine how many aren't reporting it. 52.3% reported a lifetime history of injury, so a stress fracture, a broken bone, and or medically treated tendinitis. So they're going to be probably more honest about that answer because they're not necessarily making the connection. 
And then disordered eating behaviors were associated with a greater number of lifetime injuries, which is the point I try to make to my patients. Uh, vomiting history was associated with greater likelihood of injury and increased time to recover from injury. So um, all these bad habits actually are affecting their performance and that's what we like to really drive home. So let's talk a little bit about the menstrual cycle. For the guys in the room, they love this part. Um, so it's important to realize that the first day of menses is actually the first day of the cycle. So that's usually about five days or so. Then there's the follicular phase, and that's when estradiol increases and the endometrial lining is building up. Ovulation occurs, there's that LH surge, ov ovulation occurs, the egg is released, and then the corpus luteum that's released at the same time makes progesterone, and progesterone really is predominant in this second phase, the luteal phase, and that maintains the lining. Then if there's no um, fertilization, that corpus luteum involutes and progesterone plummets, and because the progesterone is no longer there to maintain the lining, the lining is sloughed off. So that's how a normal cycle should work. And it all starts at the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus is in the brain. It makes GnRH. Oh, you guys getting that? You kind of knew. It's just pointing in the air. Menses, follicular luteal menses. Okay, so there's this little thing up here. This is the hypothalamus. This makes GnRH. It signals to the pituitary, which is pretty much right behind your nose. Um, FSH and LH to have the normal signals and that causes the ovary to make estradiol, causes the um, ovary to have that corpus luteum released and make the progesterone. So those are the, the body parts that are important here. So there's primary amenorrhea and this is important to understand that, that time frame and it's really delayed menarche and the nose cycle by the age of 15 in a girl with secondary sexual characteristics. So this is someone who's had a little bit of breast development, a little bit of hair growth, but they've had no cycle. Secondary amenorrhea is when they've had their period and they lose it. So just to get the time frame, because sometimes people get confused and they think they have a problem when they don't, eumenorrhea is 28 days plus or minus seven. So if a girl gets her period every 33 days, super, don't care, that's great. If they get it too frequently, that kind of stinks for them, but it's healthy and normal. Um, oligomenorrhea, this is when the period is longer, the, the, the time between the cycles is more than 35 days. Luteal suppression is hard for anyone to pick up unless it's an older person, older like our age, trying to get pregnant because they might not be um, having normal cycles. They have a bleed every month, but they don't realize that they have a luteal suppression. So it just means that that second phase, the luteal phase is shorter, and that's because there's not enough progesterone. So they might be having issues with pregnancy. And ovulation, same thing. They get a cycle, but they don't realize they didn't ovulate. And this can both, these can both be related to energy availability as well. And then amenorrhea is really no cycle for three months or more. So relationship between the age of menarche and the years of dance, before menarche and ballet dancers, just the fact that the more years of dance they had before they got their period, the, um, uh, what am I trying to say here? The years of dance is correlated with their menarche. So the more dancing they did, the later their menarche was. Um, and that can be thought of kind of in, a bunch of different ways. Like if, if you've been dancing a ton and you're doing tons and tons of hours of dance, then they can potentially have a delayed menarche. Um, but it also can be just that the, the time that you measured them for how many years of dance they had could have been related to how long ago their cycle was. Either way, the more dance, the more volume they do younger without good um, energy intake, the later their menarche will probably be. So what's the prevalence of menstrual dysfunction? So somewhere between 3.4 to 66% of female athletes are amenorrheic. And why is that number so broad? Well, if you ask a bunch of people on the spot if they get their period and they know why you're asking, they might say 3.4. If you actually measure their hormone levels and do a more in-depth interview, it's closer to this. So somewhere between 40 to 51% of professional ballet dancers have reported menstrual irregularity. He's really upset because he never got his period. Um, <laughs> And he's also doing a stretch that A, looks painful and also isn't that effective. Don't do this stretch. There's no need for it. He's pulling on his hips. He's pulling on his MCL. So this guy's got lots of problems. That's why he's holding his head. That's why he's holding his head. No period and his hips hurt. <laughs> so what's the prevalence of low bone density? So 20 to 50% of female athletes have low bone density. Again, um, it depends how it was measured. There used to be an older way to measure it that wasn't quite as effective. We did a study looking at 187 elite female athletes and 10.7 had a BMD Z score less than negative two. So it's a standard deviation. We want our athletes to have a BMD Z score of negative one or better. So that's pretty bad. 23% um, of professional dancers in one study had Z scores less than negative one. It really depends on the sport and the activity that they're doing. So for example, gymnasts are doing a crazy amount of pounding. Their bones tend to be pretty preserved even in the face of 
not having good cycles. Dancers are doing some pounding, but not to the same extent as, gym, as gymnasts. Gymnasts just land solid. Dancers are graceful. You know, gymnasts are landing on their wrists and landing on every body part, and dancers are supposed to land on their feet. So, in general, gymnasts seem to be somewhat protected, even though they have other issues. And then it's important to realize it's not just about estrogen. So we talked about how it's this negative energy balance. The first system in your body to shut down is kind of the most useless system, and that's the reproductive system. We don't want to take away the cardio system. We don't want to take away the pulmonary system. So it's this disruption of the, the reproductive, hypothalamic, pituitary, ovarian axis. But we've studied a lot of different hormone levels. So not only is estradiol or estrogen low, but there's a lot of different reproductive, metabolic, and bone-influencing hormones that are affected. So I put the ones in red that really have a negative impact on bone and the ones in green that are really important for bone. And you can see in amenorrheic athletes and athletes who have triad, they have an increase in this, um, this is a uh, dietary hormone, the fasting PYY, so PYY is bad, bad for bone, it increases. Ghrelin, that's a complicated one. Um, cortisol, higher cortisol levels, that's bad for bone. Growth hormone resistance, so they need growth hormone, but if their body's resistant to the growth hormone, then that's bad for bone. And then there's decreases in FSH, LH, estradiol, insulin, insulin-like growth factor, which is kind of like growth hormone, T3, which is a type of thyroid hormone, and leptin, which is important for bone. So we see a ton of changes in a lot of the work that I've been doing and a lot of colleagues of mine have done is figuring out if any of these, giving some of these back to people while you're trying to get them to gain weight has helped. And unfortunately, we're not making huge progress yet with that. And then consequences of the triad. So it's important to identify this stuff early. I think most of you know that if someone has an eating disorder or has issues with energy availability, it can get worse and it can become a lifetime issue. So you want to nip this stuff in the bud. So with really um, disordered eating and serious eating disorders, there's a lot of serious physical health problems. So fluid and electrolyte imbalances, acid-base abnormalities, cardiac arrhythmias, especially in the people that are vomiting and really restricting and vomiting heavily. And then anorectics, unfortunately, have the six times the mortality rate of the general population. In terms of performance, which is, you know, girls don't want to hear about this. This is a better way to go at them. Really, they have decreased energy, earlier fatigue, decreased coordination. What dancer wants to be uncoordinated? Um, more frequent muscle strains, sprains, and fractures. More frequent illnesses. It's harder to recover from hard rehearsals and performances. Um, and then the mental stress of this. So it gets very isolating when people become secretive and are developing rituals about food. They get stressed out about it. They feel misunderstood. They're less able to, ab uh, able to relate to others and to have uh, friendships and romantic relationships. And then the one that I'm really focused on, this osteoporosis, which they don't care about at all when they're adolescents. Um, potentially infertility problems and really these lifetime habits that can be really detrimental. So what do we do about all this? The important thing is a dancer with one component of the triad should really be evaluated for the other two, and we should all have a really low threshold for referring and thinking about this. And a broken bone is a gateway to finding out more. If you have someone with a stress fracture, it's so easy to refer them to a physician to make sure, hey, let's just see if anything else is going on. Um, so when I see somebody that I'm worried about a low energy availability or eating disorder, I suspect it when there's been weight loss. I suspect it if there's a decline in performance, a change in mood that's pretty dramatic. You know, teenagers, they all have changes in mood, so that one's a tough one. Frequent injury or illnesses, a stress fracture. Obviously, stress fracture is a great way for me to start this conversation. If they happen to have a DEXA and they have a low bone density, um, if they have known menstrual dysfunction, I wonder is that because of their eating habits? Or if they ever had an eating questionnaire and they scored poorly, that's kind of obvious. In terms of menstrual dysfunction, I suspect it um, if I already know that they have an eating disorder or disordered eating, if they have a low BMI, um, if they have a delay in developing secondary sexual characteristics, so they haven't even had their breast development, and things like that at the right time. Um, if they've had traumatic weight loss, and again, stress fracture. And then low bone density, when do I worry about that? Again, stress fracture, why did this bone break? Um, do they have a disordered eating pattern? Do they have menstrual dysfunction? Do they have malabsorption? Is it someone with celiac disease so they're not able to absorb iron and vitamin D and calcium? Is it someone who tells me they're constipated or they've always had irritable bowel? That's kind of a signal to me that maybe they have a component of the triad and they also has, haven't absorbed the nutrients that they need. So what's the workup? In general, a history and physical. So I want to talk about their diet in general. I want to talk about how much they're training, how much time they're spending in the studio, if they have other medical conditions, family history. It really stinks. You have genetics, you know, 80% of this is genetics. So if a girl's mother has osteoporosis and grandmother has osteoporosis and everybody has osteoporosis, that stinks. So we still have to maximize what we can to try to build up their bone density. 
reproductive history, so how late was their last menses, have they ever gotten a menses, has it been irregular, um, have they been on birth control, have they been on um, progesterone-only birth control, so they had things like Norplant and, and different kinds of progesterone-only, which is actually bad for bone, and other medications. Medical testing, so we figure out if they have a bone injury, so that might be x-rays or an MRI or bone scan is needed. Um, bone density, so that's a really simple test. The radiation is really minimal. It's the equivalent of flying from here to Colorado on a plane. It takes about two minutes to do. In kids, we do their spine and we do their whole body. In adults, we do their spine and their hip, and it's just because of what kind of bone, trabecular or cortical, we're looking at. And then a whole slew of labs, depending on what we're suspecting. And it's, remember, it's important to remember there could be other causes. So this is why it's good to have the whole workup. So I had a dancer once who came in, and she wasn't super thin. She seemed pretty healthy about her food. Um, she'd had a fracture, but she also had amenorrhea, so she was sent to me. Turns out she had a little benign tumor in her pituitary called a prolactinoma, and that was affecting all of her other hormones. And so it's a simple medication that she could be given to shrink that little tumor, and then she got her period back. So it's just good to keep other things on the differential. So those are all the weird endocrine ones that could be there, some of the meds that could cause it. And then for us, we really believe in a multidisciplinary team for treatment. So no one wants to just hear from the doctor saying, eat more, eat more, eat more. No one wants to go to the nutritionist and be told, eat more, drink more milk, drink more milk. So you also have to get the therapist involved and talk about what are your goals here? You want to be a professional dancer. Do you think you're going to be able to accomplish that if you're so obsessed with your food, if you're keeping your BMI really low? And then you have to give them a ton of examples of dancers who have done very well with a normal BMI or dancers that did very poorly because they tried to go along this pattern and, and really get to what is the psychological drive? What are the family issues? What are the other dynamics that are playing into this food pattern? And the more people that you can get on board, the better. So if you can be in a place where the dancer, the teacher, the people in the studio don't believe in having really restrictive eating and you can be a, a positive role model, that's so important. Um, and so getting as many people involved as the patient is, like, is, is willing to do is ideal. So there's some dietary adjustments that have to take place. Training adjustments, they might, not t might need to cut back in their volume a little bit. Uh, the counseling, I think, is very important for people who are resistant to the treatment. And sometimes medications, but these aren't necessarily the be-all, end-all. So in general, um, for basic vitamin and mineral needs, calcium, we recommend 1,300 milligrams a day for adolescents, 1,000 for people who are 19 or above. And you can only absorb 500 at a time, so it's important to have multiple servings. It's great if they can get it through food. If they really hate every dairy product on the planet, then you can try you know, fortified things like fortified orange juice. And then if that doesn't work, you can take calcium supplements. Vitamin D, none of us get enough D from about September to May living in Boston. So I just tell everybody to get on about 1,000 units a day. It's hard to overdose in vitamin D. So the goal is just when we measure the level that it's above 30 or 32. Iron, so you need about 18, these girls need about 18 milligrams per day, or if they are burning a ton of calories, they need about nine milligrams per 1,000 calories in their diet. And then anybody who tries to have a caloric intake less than 12 to 1,500 calories a day, there's no way they're gonna meet their vitamin and mineral needs. I don't care if they're just doing it through bars and they think that they're getting everything and all their supplements and their RDA through bars. They're missing their micronutrients and it just really can't be done. Uh, modified training, so we always try to get our dancers to do things like aqua therapy, do some resistance training to build their bones. They can do some bar, they can mark their routines. We can still keep them involved in dance, but just have them slowly return. And see, they start to develop bad habits while they're wearing their boot for a stress fracture, so what's she doing wrong just standing there? <laughs> she's got a little valgus, she's sitting on her hip, she's yeah. hyperextending, so then she's gonna have pain in her right side. So we really wanna keep them somewhat involved in dance and remember their good habits. Counseling, again, it depends how, where they are and, and what they need. So they could maybe need individual therapy, they might need family therapy, they might need to be in an eating disorder. If they're not making progress, we don't want to waste time, and they might need to be in an eating disorder program. Um, what's the drive? It's not usually about the food. It's about performance. It's about pleasing people. They have eight personalities. They're driven people. They have this over-conformity to the sport ethic. Um, and so really, an athlete made sacrifices for the game. I stole this stuff from Sharon Churban because um, she taught me all this stuff. Basically, an athlete strives for distinction. An athlete accepts risks and plays through pain. And an athlete accepts no limit to the pursuit of possibilities. These are the kind of people that we're treating. These are the athletes and the dancers. They're really perfectionists. So they're fine pushing through some pain and saying that it's okay to starve a little because that's what, it's, what it takes. 
Um, and then this was a program that happened out in uh, St. Paul. The St. Paul City Ballet partnered with the EMILY Project, which is a, an awareness group. Um, and they did this with the National Eating Disorder Awareness Week back in February. And they took a ton of pictures of dancers. Their dancers tend to be more muscular out there. And so they did a lot of photographs, and it was called Take Back the Tutu, and all of their dancers, men and women, were posing for shots, and they weren't the super, super thin ones, and they were showing all the strong maneuvers you can do when you have a little bit more muscle and more energy. So I'd like to thank you. I never looked like this during my pregnancy. I look more like that. <laughs>